The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Tonight on In Search Of. Hell. Many believe it's a place filled with fire, pain, and eternal suffering. We'll meet a man who claims he's been to hell and back. Vampires have long been the subject of legend and myth. The attraction of a vampire is the power. A vampire does not answer to others. But there's startling new evidence that these creatures of the night may be lurking among us today. Yes, I have taste of blood. Interesting taste, but you gotta be very careful about it. Half a million volts are running through this woman's body. Could that same power charge a top secret weapon? We'll search for the Tesla death ray. Does a monster dwell beneath the surface of this beautiful lake? Actual home video may support that claim. We have 500 known witnesses so far, but we know that there might be maybe 2,000 in total, because all of them have not dared to come out with what they've seen. The mystery begins in Sweden as we go in search of lake monsters. I'm Mitch Pileggi, and this is In Search Of. Hell. It's another world of evil and anguish, where lost souls are punished for eternity. This is the image that's been created by myth and religion. But many believe that hell's a real place. You are about to meet a man who claims that he's actually seen the flames of hell and lived to tell about it. Join us now in search of hell. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my brother, why have you forsaken me? Oh my God, I cry that you delivered them. To you they cry. And they're pushing and pulling, and then they start scratching, and then sort of clawing, and then biting. Hell is the most horrible, horrific state of existence any soul can imagine, and it goes on eternally. It seemed the more I screamed in pain, the happier they became. For thousands of years, prophets, poets, and religious zealots have described a place of unimaginable horror, an eternity of unrelenting punishment for the damned, the evil underworld of hell. In some beliefs, it's a terrible place of torture and pain and agony. In other beliefs, it's a sort of a stopping point as a place where a spirit goes to purge its evil before coming to a new life. And in some beliefs, hell is a, a temporary place where a soul is tortured for a certain amount of time and then is annihilated. The soul ceases to exist. The image of hell was influenced by the religious concept of God's retribution. Hell is a place for divine justice. You could escape justice in the world, but you could not escape justice in the afterlife. And souls consigned to hell were consigned there directly because of their own sins, their own evil deeds. And you could not hide your deeds in the afterlife. The Inferno by medieval poet Dante Alighieri depicts hell as a tunnel boring downward. As you descend, you get down into the worst sins, murder, heresy, uh, usury. At the very base of hell was Lucifer, and he was a three-headed monster, uh, sort of a, like a, a horrible mutated bird, and in the beaks of this bird, he would be gnawing on the uh, betrayers, the great betrayers of history. Whatever hell represents, no one has actually witnessed its horror and returned to talk about it. 
until now. Howard Storm, a college art professor at Northern Kentucky University, had no preconceived beliefs in heaven or hell. He was a staunch atheist. The here and now was all that mattered to Howard. My hope was to become a famous artist, and that's my whole that's what my whole life was designed around, to achieve fame and um, fortune. Everybody was either um, a factor in me getting my way, or they were a hindrance to me getting my way, and I treated people accordingly. All that would change for Howard when he took a trip to Paris in 1985. He was rushed to a hospital with a perforated stomach wall. Howard had only hours to live. I said to my wife, I said, it's time for us to say goodbye. I'm not going to make it now. When I stopped breathing and just let death come, I knew with 100% certainty that that meant the end of living and that, that meant the end of consciousness, that meant the end of me. But what happened to Howard next was more terrifying than death itself. He woke up and found himself standing in his room. Although Howard tried to speak to his wife, she ignored him. Then Howard noticed something even more puzzling. Someone was lying in his bed. And as I examined it more carefully, I was horrified and surprised that it looked just like me. But I knew it couldn't be me because I was, oh, from my point of view, awake, alive. Through the open doorway, Howard noticed medical staff out in the hall calling him. Not sure of what to do, he finally left the hospital room to follow what he thought were nurses that would take him to surgery. Howard, we've been waiting for you. With each step, they became more hideous and threatening. Howard walked for what seemed an eternity. Finally, like vultures waiting for their prey to weaken, his demonic escorts turned on him. people all over me, gnawing and clawing at me. I remember my ears being ripped off, and I remember sharp fingernails in my eyes and in the orifices of my body, trying to get inside of me. With all of his strength, Howard tried to fight the creatures off, but he was overwhelmed. It seemed the more I screamed in pain, the happier they became. And I was also aware that there were a lot of people now, dozens, hundreds, thousands, I don't know, but the noise level was absolutely deafening. No human being has ever imagined how awful that place is and the things that they can do to inflict humiliation and pain on him. Finally, Howard collapsed into the crowd of bloodthirsty savages. I heard myself, I heard my voice say, pray to God, and I thought, what a stupid idea, I don't believe in God. Desperately searching for help, Howard blurted out anything with the word God in it. People around me were horrified at the things that I was saying, and it was as if I was scalding them with live steam or something. Each time the demons heard the word, they screamed in terror God! and retreated into the darkness. I was left alone, totally broken, and ripped up, unable to go anywhere, hardly able to move at all. And instead of my life being over, I had um, been taken on this descent into this place. I believed that I was in this place for an eternity. Completely shattered, Howard lay in the bleak emptiness with no sense of time and space. I thought about my life and what a failure I'd been because I hadn't been a good husband, I hadn't been a good father, I hadn't been a good son. I knew that there was um, an inevitability and a rightness to ending up there. Suddenly, Howard noticed a tiny speck of light that grew larger as it sped toward him. And hands reached down and lifted me up into this light. And as I was being picked up, for the first time in this darkness, I saw myself and I looked like roadkill. As these hands were picking me up, all that stuff started disappearing and everything came back together. And, and more importantly, on the inside, I was in abject despair. And as I was being picked up, that was turned into 
an ecstasy that um, I live every moment of my life to recapture that someday. <laughs> an ecstasy beyond description. Howard's rescue from hell into this heavenly world transformed him. I felt so ashamed. I felt like I was such a bad person, so undeserving of these feelings of love and goodness that I was getting. In an instant, Howard was back in his hospital bed. When he opened his eyes, he was on his way to surgery. Howard's physical recovery took over a year. His emotional recovery took much longer. There was definitely elements in there that, that he can't even describe to this day without breaking down in tears. And that's, that's the most affecting part of his, of his experience for me. I don't think that the things that he saw can be fabricated by, by just an overactive imagination. Howard Storm's terrifying journey led him to a new understanding of what hell is. If we are cruel, manipulative, we're going to experience the pain and the cruelty that we have imposed upon others. We're going to experience that. Dr. Barbara Romer offers a scientific explanation for Storm's experience. The medical community would typically say that the near-death experience is a physiologic episode, that it is not spiritual, that it occurs secondary to anoxia, which is low blood oxygen, possibly to a hallucination, to dissociation, to blocking of receptor sites in the brain, or to endorphins. But Dr. Romer is not sure that medical theory applies to Howard Storm. What speaks for the validity of these experiences as being true experiences is the significant clarity of thought and the very vivid memory. I know of no dream, hallucination, delusion, chemical reaction, anoxic reaction, endorphin reaction, which will cause these permanent, profound changes. Whether hell is a real place, a religious belief, or some scenario we conjure in death according to what we believe in life, it remains a horrifying vision of unearthly terror. Howard Storm's personal experience may be the only proof that anyone in search of hell will ever find. Coming up, a high-voltage killing machine kept secret for decades. And what danger lurks beneath the surface of this quiet lake? Just in here and saw the, the serpent diving into the lake. I felt the hair rise in my neck. But first, is a new generation of vampires roaming the night? We'll see how they quench their thirst or human blood. Vampire. The brooding gothic bloodsucker is a popular figure in television, film, and books. But have romantic notions of the vampire allowed it to leap from folklore into the modern world? Some terrifying events suggest that a new breed of vampire is on the loose. The vampire's fanged kiss promises eternal life in a seductive essence that irresistibly leads to sexual conquest. It's an erotic dance, a ballet of blood, luring us to the dark side. We feel safe knowing that this monster is only imaginary. But here's the shocking truth. Vampires have clawed their way out of legend and history, leaping straight into the real world. Today, all across the United States and parts of Europe, modern day vampires are emerging from the shadows. These night crawlers embrace the world of the vampire as an alternative lifestyle, complete with gothic attire, seductive kissing, and in some cases, a genuine lust for blood. Yes, I have tasted blood. Um, matter of fact, tonight. 
Interesting taste, but you gotta be very careful about it. Jason Ganella sees no conflict between the vampire lifestyle and his job with the United States military. The attraction of a vampire is the power. A vampire, whether it be real or mythological, does not answer to others. Artist Sherry Esfignati is attracted to something else. What's so fascinating about being a vampire that is, it's a forbidden fruit, it's a taboo, it's exotic, and it's mystical. Kalila Smith, author and historian, has studied the phenomena extensively. The vampires come from all walks of life. Oftentimes it's runaways. Other times it's people who have very, very ordinary jobs. Could be your neighbor, your banker, your child's teacher. And um, at night, in the secrets of their homes, they actually drink blood. It's only a small percentage, though, that would actually resort to violence or murder to obtain this blood. For these night stalkers, living the vampire lifestyle in public is liberating and enticing but some have crossed over into the dark side, leaving death in their wake. After leading his followers in a blood drinking ritual, vampire cult leader Rod Farrell joined in the brutal murder of his friend's parents. In 1998, Joshua Rudiger, who claimed to be a blood drinking vampire, slashed the throats of four people in San Francisco. One of them died. But if vampirism is defined by a thirst for blood, Rudiger and Farrell pale in comparison to Vlad Dracula. The 16th century Transylvanian prince executed 40,000 men, women, and children by impaling them on wooden stakes. It is said that he enjoyed drinking the blood of his victims while dining amid their corpses. He was nicknamed Vlad Sepish, or Vlad the Impaler. Using the historical Vlad Sepish as his inspiration, Bram Stoker published the novel Dracula in the late 19th century. In a bizarre twist, Vlad Dracula also inspired this man to adopt his name in the Impaler's thirst for blood. New Orleans resident Vlad Sepish Knight actually believes that he's a modern day vampire. We don't live in the same bodies for hundreds of thousands of years. We do eventually die. We just age slower, heal a lot faster, are less susceptible to disease. And we do need to drink blood. In choosing his prey, Vlad Sepish Knight uses the vampire's legendary powers of seduction. It's willing people. I don't go around attacking people. Mainly my preference is the ladies. There are people that prefer males as well. It's an erotic feeling because a lot of ladies enjoy it. A lot of times I will possibly bite them and draw from the skin. I don't leave puncture marks. In fact, less than what you give in a blood bank. So there's really no after effects on them other than a little bit of ecstasy on their side. The compulsion to drink blood and the vampire's fearsome appearance may have a medical explanation. It is a disease called porphyria. A person with porphyria has some sort of deficiency in the blood that creates a condition where the gums start receding, so it looks as if they're developing fangs. The skin becomes very, very fragile and very thin. They have sensitivity to light in the eyes and the skin. Eventually, mental derangement takes over, and these people may attack someone. Vlad Sepish Knight does not have porphyria, though he does display many of its symptoms. When I don't feed, I get sick. Okay, I get a little bit sickly, I get less energetic. I find that it's, I'm a lot less tolerant of sunlight. Um, I'm a lot less tolerant of people. When these people did replace what was missing in their blood, by possibly drinking the blood of others, that the symptoms sort of subsided. Many modern day vampires have engineered a legal way to get their precious life-giving fluid by forming sacred feeding circles. Vampire expert Catherine Ramslin has studied the dynamics of this disturbing relationship. Within the vampire culture, there are people who consider themselves donors. 
and they tend to be more submissive. They're looking for some more powerful person to overwhelm them, and they want to surrender to that. They want the blood to be taken from them. So they want to be the ones the vampire goes to. Despite the obvious health risks of drinking human blood, the modern vampire's kiss is rarely lethal. But vampire experts warn of a new menace on the horizon. They claim that this breed of monster uses psychic force to drain the life from your body. There are others who call themselves psychic vampires who are not drinking blood, but who are taking your life essence. Usually with a blood drinker, there's always some sort of prearranged consent there. With the psychic vampires, what makes them so dangerous is that the victims usually don't know that it's going on. These people have mastered taking energy from other people. They can pull that energy right through the eyes of the victim. It can make the person very tired. It can damage the immune system. Eventually, the person gets sick. The person could even die. Insatiable blood drinkers, nocturnal club denizens, and psychic parasites. Are they victims of their own fascination with vampires, or are they actually members of the same sinister species? The truth remains shrouded, but be forewarned. In the search for vampires, the hunter may become the hunted. Later, on In Search Of. Think sea monsters are nothing but a myth? Then you haven't been to this Swedish lake. But first, was a powerful death ray secretly invented nearly a century ago? The electrifying facts, next on In Search Of. Imagine the power of lightning at your fingertips. Now channel four million volts of electricity through the barrel of a gun, and you've built a death ray. That unstoppable superweapon may no longer belong to the realm of science fiction. Experts say that a working ray gun was developed decades ago. If so, who controls this lethal secret today? Let's begin the search for Tesla's death ray. powerful weapon that could strike like lightning, annihilating anything in its path. Ray guns have powered science fiction for a century. If only there were more power! Evidence now suggests that the death ray is more fact than fiction. And recently released footage stands as chilling proof that yesterday's fantasy is today's weapon of war. A Serbian immigrant by the name of Nikola Tesla was considered to be one of the great scientific minds of all time. In the 1930s, he allegedly designed a working death ray. Tesla's definition of a death ray was the ability to have a generator that would produce a very large electrical charge and then to be able to aim that, much like a flashlight or a laser light beam, to a distant target, thus destroying or disabling the opposing force. The search for the death ray begins mysteriously inside a New York hotel where Nikola Tesla lived for nine years. Tesla had fallen on hard times, and the hotel accepted whatever he had placed in storage as collateral for unpaid bills. Some believe that this included a miniature prototype of his death ray. For over 60 years, Tesla had made brilliant contributions to modern science. Without Nikola Tesla, we would not have alternating current. We would not have television. We would not have radio. In 1893, Tesla's alternating current made it possible to safely transmit electricity across great distances. His genius paved the way to light the world. Tesla even harnessed the power of lightning with his invention of the Tesla coil. 
A Tesla coil is used in practically every electronic device you can name. Your TV set, your radios, all have Tesla coils because they all require high voltage electricity. The Tesla coil ionizes the air and can be used to create a spectacular display. But one miscalculation can be fatal. With half a million volts, enough to power 250 deadly electric chairs, the Tesla coil is a very dangerous platform. Nightclub entertainer Cinder Moon puts her life on the line with every performance. When I do my show, I get soaking wet and I stand on top of uh, the Tesla coil, which will run 500,000 volts of electricity through my body. When lightning is coming out of my fingertips, it does create burns on the end of my fingertips. If I were to get too close to something, I would ground, which could cause a surge of electricity to go through my body, thus resulting in a heart attack. I've had electricians come in and see my show and get deathly petrified and run to the back of the club thinking that I'm going to electrocute myself. It was the man-made lightning produced by the Tesla coil that inspired the death ray. An accelerator that could transmit a tightly focused beam of charged electron particles. Anything in its path would be obliterated. At a press conference, Tesla announced his latest invention, a death beam capable of destroying 10,000 planes from 250 miles away. Tesla offered his death ray to American military leaders in 1940. The official story is that they had no interest in the weapon. Three years later, Nikola Tesla died at the age of 86. Immediately after his death, Tesla's documents and notebooks, engineering notebooks, were confiscated by the United States government by the Bureau of Alien Affairs and held there until after the war. Experts believe that the FBI opened the locker containing Tesla's miniature prototype. What they found inside has never been revealed. Where has it gone to in the world today? Why was it not accounted for in anybody's inventory? That's like asking whatever happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Nobody's talking about it. The FBI may have seized Tesla's prototype, but many believe the research papers for the weapon fell into foreign hands. There was evidence to indicate that the Soviet Union did look over his papers to find out if there was anything of military significance. Some believe that Soviet leaders may have ordered development of Tesla's death ray to counter America's early lead in nuclear arms. In 1960, U-2 pilot Francis Gary Powers was flying well above Soviet surface-to-air missile range when he saw a bright flash and lost all control of his spy plane. Some claim he fell victim to a Soviet version of Tesla's death ray. Additional evidence emerged in the 1970s. It's considered proprietary, it's considered government secret, but there are aerial reconnaissance photographs of facilities that were taken over Russia that bear out the possibility that they were working on Tesla technology and advancing his ideas. And in fact, it was speculated that they developed a death ray weapon there. Was the Soviet Union armed with Tesla's death ray? When we come back, the United States plays catch up and shocking video taken from the space shuttle seems to reveal a death ray in action. The target, a UFO. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. The search continues for a mysterious device commonly referred to as Tesla's death ray. 
a particle beam weapon that could sow destruction at the speed of light. Many believe that the Soviet Union used the pioneering work of scientific genius Nikola Tesla to develop a deadly ray gun. But two can play that game, and the United States forged ahead with its own death ray program. The research work done under the Star Wars Strategic Initiative, or SDI as we know it, followed the idea of a coherent beam of charged particles with a high voltage source as the power supply being able to strike a distant remote target. That's the very concept of Tesla's so-called death ray. Such a weapon could obliterate aircraft and missiles and blast satellites out of orbit, all in the blink of an eye. The Cold War is over, but that hasn't stopped the death ray arms race. The United States holds the edge. This gleaming 747 is the first in a fleet of U.S. Air Force jets to be fitted with a swiveling nose cone laser, capable of destroying enemy missiles hundreds of miles away. And this is THEL, the tactical high-energy laser. This ground-based laser sends a beam whose core temperature is greater than the surface of the sun. Recently released footage serves as dramatic evidence that the Star Wars program has moved off the drawing board and onto the battlefield. Thel demonstrates its destructive power as the laser destroys two incoming missiles. With this one test, Nikola Tesla's plan for a death ray has become frighteningly real. There are plans to place a similar system in outer space. But will an orbiting death ray target missiles launched from Earth or a hostile spacecraft from another world? This shocking video of a live NASA transmission may hold the answer. Taken from the space shuttle, it appears to show an unidentified flying object hovering far above the Earth. Suddenly, the UFO takes evasive action, dodging what appears to be a bolt of energy fired from the Earth. Could the Tesla death ray already be part of Earth's defense against invasion? Controversy still rages over the content of this video. NASA calls it an optical illusion, but UFO experts claim that it's proof of an Earth-based ray gun system. Laser cannons, charged particle beams, electromagnetic guns. Modern weapons that deliver lethal force at the speed of light, powered by fear, imagination, and the high voltage genius of Nikola Tesla, inventor of the death ray. Imagine a quiet day on the lake when suddenly a 20-foot monster swims across your path. It happened to this woman, and she caught it on tape. Next. Sea monsters, lake creatures. Huge scaly beasts forgotten by time and evolution lurking in the murky darkness. If these sound like mere campfire legends, don't tell that to locals near two Scandinavian lakes where sudden attacks have terrified generations of swimmers and boaters. Now, a rare videotape offers chilling evidence that may keep you on dry land for good. Lake Stuhuen, Sweden. This woman is on holiday, laughing, smiling, and about to videotape a rare and shocking sight, an encounter with a sea serpent. Was it a monster of the deep? On the same lake, this man claims to have been attacked, his boat overturned and hurled into the sky by the angry whipping tail of a 20-foot sea creature. Was this vicious perpetrator the great Swedish lake monster known as Stussy? 
Legends about menacing sea serpents have staked their dark and foreboding claim inside the human heart since man first began to record his fears. Lake Stuklin in the mountains of northern Sweden is home to Stusi, a creature recognized and feared for over 400 years. Ann Odstein is a local historian. We have 500 known witnesses so far, but we know that there might be maybe 2,000 in total, because all of them have not dared to come out with what they've seen. While some locals believe in her existence, others contend that she is pure fiction. But for some, no proof is necessary. They claim to have tangled with the Swedish monster. Ragnar Björks is an administrator with the Jamtlands Fisheries Department. One day while checking fishing permits on Lake Stuhuen, he had the fright of his life. The lake was very calm, when suddenly a huge tail broke through the surface, right beside his rowboat. Bjork struck at the monster with his oar, hitting it on the back. Its tail struck back and flipped the rowboat 10 feet in the air. Bjorks was able to escape and return to shore. He never believed in the lake monster, but after this violent encounter, Ragnar Bjorks knows that danger lurks below Lake Stuhuen. Could this serene lake be the home of a sea monster? Are the eyewitness accounts to be believed? The first thing I saw were the humps. There were five or six of them about 30 feet away. Gunbrit Widmark, along with 20 other senior citizens, was vacationing aboard the steamship Tumi. They had spotted a series of humps connected to a lizard-like head that had emerged from the lake. I wish I had turned my video camera on earlier, but I was very frightened. I tried to capture the image of the animal's head, but by the time I reached it, the creature had submerged. I know what I saw that day, and I will never forget it. Others have said that uh, when the monster shows itself, it is a sign of bad times. Ulla Oskarsson is with the Japlands Lands Museum. Her job is to preserve the historical record of Stusi. Oskarsson's research uncovered a story about Stusi's origin that suggests she is a magical creature come to life. Legend has it that in ancient times, two magicians concocted a brew that boiled for years and years. One day, the water began to churn and heave violently, when all of a sudden there was a loud noise and a monster erupted and burst forth. Horrified by what they had unleashed, the magicians cast a spell to keep the serpent bound. They carved a secret code into a rune stone. As long as the code remained a mystery, the serpent would be bound. People managed to solve the mystery of, of the, the rune letters in the late 19th century. And that was the time when a lot of observations were happening in the lake here. There were so many sightings in the late 19th century that the town commissioned a trap to be built. It was designed to capture and kill the beast. It was made 1894. You, you open it up and you had uh, some bait in here. And uh, as soon as something touches it, it goes together and, and uh, capture the animal that is in it. This iron monster catcher stands as a reminder that in the decade prior to the dawn of the 20th century, there was an explosion of sightings. The amount has never been duplicated until our time. But Stussy is not alone. There is more than one Scandinavian Leviathan. And when we come back, a monster hunter attempts a new technique to prove the existence of these mysterious creatures. Could this be the first ever recording of a lake monster?
centuries, there have been reports of terrifying encounters with enormous sea creatures in the lake regions of Scandinavia. Recent video evidence of Sweden's legendary lake monster, Stussy, indicates that something unusual and unexplainable lurks beneath these calm waters. At Lake Seljutsvatnet, located in Norway, eyewitnesses describe another mysterious sea serpent. It is said to be 40 feet long with a horse-shaped head that rises above the water as it swims. Her name is Selma. Erik Engsutter is a highly respected boat captain on Lake Seljutsvatnet. He has been reluctant to share his observations until now. At this moment, we are at the place where I had my first observation. Just in here, I saw the, the serpent diving into the lake. I felt the hair rise in my neck. I didn't dare to tell anybody about that. Researcher Jan Uwe Sundby has dedicated his life to hunting the elusive Selma. Today, he begins a new investigation. He will try to track his underwater nemesis with a hydrophone, an underwater listening device on loan from the Swedish Navy. You have to be here over a certain period of time, everything from a week to two weeks, and then you have to listen regularly. After days of patient listening, Sunbai's hydrophone picks up a frightening sound from the watery depths. Could this be the first ever recording of a sea monster? The mystery of the Norwegian lake monsters continues to deepen. Recently, Lake Stukwin, the alleged lair of Stusi, has been the location of another sighting. Aelin and Cecilia Hemrius are cousins, and they live near Lake Stuhuen. While on summer break, the girls decided to go for a swim in the legendary lake. A few moments into their swim, Cecilia noticed a slow-moving hump in the distance. She alerted her cousin, and both girls froze in horror. 20 yards ahead of them was the sea serpent. The young girls frantically swam back to shore. The behemoth dipped in and out of the water three times and then vanished. Together, Aelin and Cecilia created a sculptured replica of what they had seen on that fateful night. They also made drawings of Stussy's humps, her body and her long neck and head. These two pre-teenagers survived to report one of the closest and most chilling encounters yet with a great lake monster. Selma, Stussy. Are they the descendants of ancient sea predators? Are they a projection of the darkness inside all of us? Or are they magical creatures from a realm normally hidden from our five senses? Only one thing is certain. Something in these waters has frightened and enthralled people for hundreds of years. I believe there is a lake monster, and not until they've emptied the lake from all of its water and have actually seen that there is nothing there, then I believe it isn't there. Thanks for watching In Search Of. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night.